Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Dr. Jennifer Stelter. She has written the book, The Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advanced Alzheimer's Disease. And not only are we going to talk today, we're also going to have another episode next week. So thank you for joining me. Can you give us your background? Give us, tell us about you first, and then we'll go into the book and all your great advice. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you for having me. Um, So I'm a clinical psychologist by trade. I have a very eclectic, I guess, background, if you would call it that. Um, Being a clinical psychologist, I think I started off in the, you know, what you would expect as a normal path of a psychologist, you know, going to graduate school and um, conducting clinical work. Um, I have actually some research uh, research background as well. Uh, I worked at a number of universities and different types of mental health centers and hospitals and things like that across the country. And uh, where I really started to uh, work with individuals who are aging was in my postdoctoral fellowship. I was actually in a, re- I was conducting a research project between Northwestern University here in the state of Illinois and the Heinz uh, VA, the Veterans uh, Affairs Center. And so uh, I actually was working with seniors on how to live healthfully and how to really try to extend their life. And so that was a really rewarding experience. And I absolutely fell in love with the aging population at that time. And so when I graduated from my postdoc, my first, uh, I guess, real job right outside of that was in senior living. I actually uh, joined a a major long-term care company here in the state of Illinois. They're in the Midwest and also Wisconsin. And um, I actually was hired to run one of their behavioral health programs within one of their nursing facilities. Uh, And so although I went into mental health, my role quickly changed. I actually uh, uh, worked my way up into operations once I became licensed. And I started to work with not only, of course, the behavioral health directors of the company, but also memory care directors. I was working with our social workers. I was working with our activity professionals, right? And doing a whole host of other things. And so when I started to work in memory care, really that was somewhat new for me. And I'm going to be honest, you know, going through graduate school, of course, we have um, some, you know, studies in dementia. However, it's not a sole focus. And so not being a sole focus, it was something where I really had to learn everything about dementia on my own. And so I, knowing that this was really a, a continued, I would say, epidemic um, within our industry, uh, as well as within the world, I said, I I really want to learn more. And so I took it upon myself over really a 10-year period to study everything I could study. I went to conferences. I networked. I met with individuals who were um, authors uh, who had created models on their own, very familiar with following some of the major gurus like Cameron Camp and David Trexel and um, Tipa Snow and um, Vicki DeClerc from the Validation Institute, right? All those... uh, just awesome gurus who had so much to spread and, and learn about, you know, had to teach about the about dementia care. And so for me, um, it was really taking what I learned and applying it into the setting where I was working. And so I was overseeing about 17 memory care programs, and that served um, uh, quite a number of staff, of course, and thousands of residents. And so at that time, what I was doing was taking what I've learned and applying it, you know, uh, directly with the patients, as well as training and educating the staff on how to best interact and connect with those individuals who have dementia. And so that's really my uh, kind of journey in uh, my career, honestly. And so um, there's been other things that I've been involved in, uh, created my own business as well, as you can see here on NeuroEssence. Uh, I have a business partner who's a biologist. Uh, her name is Jessica Ryan. And uh, at, at NeuroEssence, what sets us apart is we, of course, specialize in dementia care, doing traditional uh, training and education. We develop programs for uh, senior living spaces and uh, private practices, organizations, but we also work individually with families in their homes to develop these programs for those they're caring for with dementia. And then we do consultative efforts. But what really sets us apart is we focus on non-pharmacological interventions. So what we can do with our hands and our heart to connect 
with individuals who have dementia. And so we use a lot of the practices that are in my book um, to develop these programs and to implement them so that way everyone can use them. And so that's really what we do at NeuroEssence. So that's really my journey. So um, I have a hodgepodge of other things too, but um, uh, I, I've always loved to uh, myself be a, a forever student to become educated and then spread that love to other people. And my business partner has the same passion. Well, we do know that continued learning is good for our brains, yes, good for absolutely. our aging. <laughs> so absolutely. it's, um, I went from being a professional portrait photographer to being a podcaster. And so I learned a lot of stuff and it's, I think that was good for me. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, it's been, it's been a fun journey, but, um, I will make sure that your neuro essence is also linked in the show notes because that sounds also interesting. And I, I've talked to a lot of caregivers who do like the essential oils, which you do talk about in your book, how to use them, when to use them and that kind of stuff. So it's, I, I personally am a non-pharmacy. I try to do everything naturally if I can, obviously that's not always possible, but my dad was on what I always called a pharmacological soup of so many different drugs. They had no idea what any of them were doing with each other. Just, it was impossible. Right. It was over t like a, two dozen. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. Wow. And it, you know, and every time he'd have interactions because of, you know, a new drug, they would give him, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm experiencing these symptoms. And then they give him another one. It's like, how about we like dial back some of this nonsense? Right. Because one is probably causing the other. Yeah, exactly. And that's and what happens I, in, in our field. There's just an overuse of pharmacy in, uh, in the dementia care field. And it's just very unfortunate because there's a lot that can be done from a non-pharmacological perspective that it just takes the time to learn it, implement it, and be able to see its success. Yeah, my experience with like my mom's memory care residents, they were fantastic, mm -hmm. but they could have used more training. They could have definitely used more staff so that each person would have more time to devote to whatever needs residents had. It wasn't like they were neglected or, you know, there wasn't enough staff to take care of what needed to be taken care of. There just wasn't enough staff to, you know, coerce your mother into the shower or, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they had residents that needed to, you know, had gotten to the stage of the disease that they needed to be fed. And that obviously takes time and you can't help somebody else when you're feeding, you know, so-and-so. And, -so. and mm -hmm. so that's, you know, they need to change the um, fee structure for those kind of, you know, the, the whole financial way of those, that industry needs to change, but I don't know how, cause that's not my thing. So I 100% agree with you. So, well, I'm pretty sure it will change as the population's aging. Cause it just, it, there won't be an option not to change, but I will be 55 after this episode comes, well, before this episode comes out. So I'm not sure it's going to change fast enough for me, but I'm doing everything I can to keep my brain strong. So maybe I can just move to assisted living. So other people can take care of stuff like cooking and cleaning and maintenance of the facility and, you know, the home, et cetera. And I can just do whatever the hell I want. That's my plan. <laughs> Well, the last chapter of my book is on brain health, and it gives you um, some just easy strategies to implement that can help you to keep your brain strong. So there you go. So it's even another reason to read the book, yeah. So, which is going to be linked in the show notes, too. So you guys all know I always do that. So your book talks about the dementia connection model. Yes. So why don't you explain that? Because I will probably butcher it if I try. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so how, let me talk a little about the how the model came to be, and then I'll get into the framework. So essentially, you know, as you've learned, my background is was not specifically in dementia care. Everything I, I learned was on my own. And so when I would learn different types of strategies or approaches, you know, I, I would bring it back and we would talk about it as a team and we would implement them at the company that I was working for. I had wonderful memory care directors um, that were just humoring me every step of the way, which was great. Um, I think for myself, it was really when my, uh, well, let me back up here, you know, just listening to staff, you know, Staff were struggling with really understanding the disease. They were uh, struggling with the progression, right? You hear a lot of these um, typical statements in dementia care, like, 
you need to um, live in their world is a very typical statement, right? But nobody asks why. They just say, okay, live in their world. Okay, I can do that. Or yeah, show me how to do that. But no one says, well, why do I need to do that, right? Or, you know, um, let's just say a, a person with dementia becomes aggressive. You know, it's like people will say, oh, that's part of the disease process. Well, no one says, well, why does that happen? Right. So for me, when I developed the framework, I wanted to answer those questions. Why really easily, no matter if you're a family member who is working with someone, with, you know, caring for someone with dementia or if you're a staff member in a facility, I wanted to answer that why very easily. So that was one piece that went into the model that I thought was very important. But the other piece was or the second piece was when I was actually during this process, I was actually having children myself. And when my children uh, were born, I have, I, they're now five and seven. When I was writing the book, I think that they were two and four or something like that. But everything came alive for me. I was at home caring for my, my children. And then I would go into the facilities and I would see the same types of behavioral expressions. I would see the same types of struggles within my patients who had dementia. And of course, the same frustrations as a parent I was having, staff were having, with uh, the people we were treating. So I thought to myself, there's a connection here. There's a connection here and I need to figure it out, right? And so the third piece of it, being a clinical psychologist, I said, you know what? Humans are all alike, no matter what is going on with uh, our brain, whether it's diseased or not, we're all alike. We all have, most of us have all the same parts. And so with that said, there's gotta be something said around the cognitive behavioral approach, which I'm very familiar with, of course, in this perspective. So th that's kind of the, the backdrop behind it. And I'm gonna go into detail here. So the dementia connection model is essentially a framework of three pillars. The first pillar is uh, retrogenesis, the theory of retrogenesis. Now I didn't develop that. That was developed by Dr. Barry Reisberg many years ago. So I followed his research and it was a really just uh, beautiful understanding of what was going on. It was answering the why for me and I thought to myself, if it's understanding the why for me, it's got to help other people understand as well. Now, what the theory is, essentially, he says that and this is, again, through years of research, that as the disease progresses, the individual is actually going in reverse with all of their skills and everything. So we're not just talking their ability to take care of themselves. We're talking about a communication. We're talking about emotional expression, behavioral expression. We're talking about maturity. Uh, we're talking about um various ways of coping, right? These are all going in reverse to infancy. And he had pinpointed very specifically that individuals uh, from moderate to late stage are really anywhere in their developmental age of seven to about four weeks old. Now, he's not saying, and neither is my model, saying treat individuals with dementia like children, because that is absolutely not the way to go about this at all. What it is, it's just an understanding that maybe you are working with someone who has a chronological age of 75, but the developmental age could be someone who is five years old, who is three, who is one years old, right? So it's us being able to say, let me put myself in the shoes of that person. What I expect, right? So this is all about expectation. Would I expect a one-year-old to act like an adult? Would I expect a five-year-old? And so on, right? So we as caregivers can lower expectation of that person to really align with them, right? So there's a lot that goes into that component, right? Um, of them getting younger, right? Getting younger in some respect, right? Uh, the lovely thing I talk about this in the book is the greatest thing is that you will get to know that person as they are 25 years old, then as they are 13, then they are as five because their personality goes back in reverse as well. So it's awesome that you get to see all those aspects of them, right? Um, but what's really going on, right? So this idea of, you know, can you, you need to live in the world of that person really means that their world is very similar to a young child's. That's what that means. And so a lot of people, that was never explained to them. So how does a young child learn? How does a young child act? How does a young child communicate and so on and so forth, right? And really much of it before the age of five is through their senses, right? Mm -hmm. And so I joke and I say, you know, when a, when a baby is born, right? And they um, start to communicate a little bit. And we, of course, 
we usually try to teach them mama and dada, right? They're only learning that because of what they're hearing and what they're seeing. They don't pick up a book at at six months old and be like, okay, there's my mother. And now I know that's mama, right? They don't do that. So they only have learned that through their senses. So the assumption is, is that as someone with dementia is progressing, they're going to rely on their senses to start to navigate their world now. That's what they're going to be able to connect to the world. And so when we talk about living in their world, it's saying, I need to work with them by experiencing what they're experiencing through their senses. What are they seeing and hearing and tasting and touching and smelling at all times, right? Because you think about it, right? Think about something as simple as um, our voice, right? So when an infant can uh, hear their mom's voice, right? Usually they have a big smile on their face, right? They get their calm because they know mom is in the room, right? Because the re- research shows that, you you know, the baby can even hear mom's voice through the womb, right? So that's in of itself a, a sensory stimulation of the auditory system, right? They're hearing mom's voice and they're calm and or they're happy. It's positive feelings, right? So the assumption is, is that we can do the same with people with dementia, right? Is we can connect with them by influencing their senses using positive stimuli, right? So that's the, the first pillar. And that's the cognitive piece when we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Or a cognitive behavioral approach, right? Is that this is the way they're thinking now. This is the way they're living their world, right? The second pillar is called habilitation. This is the how. How do you apply this model, right? And so this is really the behavioral approach that we're going to use. And so when I talked about that, you know, all humans are basically the same, right? Is that we love positive reinforcement. I mean, you can't argue with that, right? Nope. And so, so part of it, I talk about the three R's. I actually learned the three R's through uh, a dementia guru named Josh Friedis. Uh, he uh, actually wrote the book, The Dementia Concept. And he talks about routine, remind, reward are the three words, right? So we apply that to my model. Routine is we have to apply the dementia connection model consistently. And we know that people with dementia thrive on consistency and structure, right? The remind are the sensory cues we're going to use. because We're going to get to that, the approach side here in a second. That's the third pillar. We're going to use sensory cues. And the third is the reward. The reward is that the person you're caring for wins. And guess what? You as the caregiver win too. You win because you get to see the beautiful smile on their face. You get to see how calm they are. You get to see um, how much they uh, really are enjoying themselves, right? And we love that as caregivers. So everybody wins. I always talk about the win-win in my book, right? So using the three the three R's in the process of habilitation, that's the second pillar. I, maybe I failed to mention that. And so habilitation is basically how do you reinforce skills, which is the behavioral therapy component, right? And that's using the three R's, okay? Now, the third pillar, which is uh, basically sensory-based knowledge, is that we know then people with dementia who are getting younger, they're going to take in information through their senses and process it, right? Now, the goal here is to use sensory stimuli that are positive for them, right? Um, and so when they are when they are feeling positive, right, or we're using positive stimuli, um, that will influence positive emotions. Why is that? So I'm going to get a little clinical here. So what happens is when we experience this, and this is for all humans, when we experience um, stimuli through our senses, whether it's good, whether it's bad, right? What happens is it, it, it either directly or indirectly influences our limbic system right? And in our limbic system houses a little being called the amygdala. And the amygdala is what, amongst other things that it does, it generates our emotions, right? So what happens is, and when I say directly or indirectly, it's because the olfactory system, what we smell, directly influences the amygdala. Research has shown that. Indirectly is what we see and what we taste and what we touch and what we... um, Smell? Did I say that? No, smell is the, the direct. So um, so all other senses indirectly influence the limbic system. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're, we're kind of playing on the benefit of what the brain does with this model 
by, of course, uh, using positive stimuli to influence positive emotions. And so we've all seen it, right? So we're all kind of doing this already. It's just putting names to it. So essentially think of music, right? Music has been studied extensively with people with dementia. Not only does it help to influence positive moves, but uh, there's been some cognitive benefits as well, right? So, but you think about it, if you just think about you and I, it, you can probably name songs that you play that make you feel motivated and happy and excited. And then there are songs that you can play that will, of course, without a doubt, make you feel sad, depressed, or angry or irritable, right? <laughs> well, the same thing applies for people with dementia. Find out what their preferences are. What kind of music do they like? You know, what kind of foods do they like? What kind of smells do they enjoy, right? What kind of um, visual aids do they like, you know, in terms of pictures or things that bring them joy, right? And you're going to use those things on a regular basis to be able to influence those positive emotions. Now, I'm going to go back to another um, uh, saying that you probably have heard, right? That if, uh, you know, it doesn't matter your name, it doesn't matter what you do, it's how that person with dementia feels with you, right? So this dementia connection model makes that come alive. It's saying that if you can influence them to have positive emotions, they're going to feel all these good emotions around you all the time. Therefore, they're going to connect to you. And that's why it's called the dementia connection model. I have a quick I have a quick story that demonstrates that. I always like to take my mom to the park to watch kids generally or we'd go to the library or wherever. And she would be out in the sunlight. It was just a very positive experience. Once we got to the park and we were sitting on the bench, it was positive. Getting there was a little challenging. And that's what I did a lot. I would take her out of the residence and try to give her in and, and it was challenging because you know, she <laughs> She couldn't watch the, her visual processing was really shot and, you know, her attention span was shot. So it was very difficult to do, but watching kids was her pleasure and that was easy enough to handle. And that's what we did. So we did that all the time. We'd go to the park or wherever. This one particular day, so this was September, 2019. So she was in the last year of her life. My husband and I had come home from a conference. If you anybody's flown through or out of Denver, you know that they're constantly delayed because of wacky weather. So we didn't get home until one or so in the morning. And I am like a complete sunshine daylight person. Sun is up. I'm awake. Sun is down. I'm gone. You know, it's like I'm solar charged. I'm a Californian. This is the way it is. And so I knew I was tired and I've learned from negative experiences with mom that if I was tired or stressed, even if I didn't think I was showing it, she sensed it 110%. Right. So I show up on this particular day. It actually happened to be my wedding anniversary. And I brought my wedding album, which she put together because my dad, his he was a photographer as well. His associate did our wedding. So she was very integral in choosing the pictures and putting the book together and everything. But I knew she wouldn't remember any of the people in it. It was just it was just something to do because I was afraid trying to take her out that day would was would result in a negative experience. And neither one of us wanted that. So I show up and she sees me and she now she, most of my listeners know, but you don't. My mom thought I was her best friend, which mm -hmm. was fine. <clears throat> so she sees me and she goes, oh, hi, where are we going today? And I was like, excuse me, like you don't remember our relationship you don't remember what you did five minutes ago. If I go to the bathroom, you won't remember I'm here. But you remember that we go out all the time. That just blew my mind. I'm like, literally, like, like the puffs of dust came out my ears. I was shocked. I was just, And then I felt gu guilty because I was like, oh, crap. Now we're not going anywhere today. <laughs> well, she's associating, yeah, yeah. She's, she's associating your face with the emotion she has felt over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. It made me feel good that she felt that way. Then I felt guilty we weren't going out, but I did bring a chocolate spice bread that I made, which is really super good. And so that <laughs> that cured that problem. So there you <laughs> chocolate go. fixes all things. So yeah, my <laughs> listeners have probably heard that story a lot, but it, mm -hmm. it does reinforce what you're talking about is like how you make them feel is important. And it's you may not realize like 90% of the time I didn't know if my mom even registered 
what we were doing. I know she had zero idea of how much effort it was. So that was very rewarding that she she says, oh, hi, where are we going today? I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, <laughs> so I felt very her her dying was a little bit sudden, sort of. But it was a blessing because I have no idea what I would have done with her during the pandemic. There was no kids in parks. Parks were closed. It was just like last year would have been super, super ugly. So I'm very glad I didn't have to try to figure out how to take somebody that I had spent a lot of time dragging to the park <laughs> and try to figure out what to do with them when that wasn't an option. So right. I was lucky that way. So how does this dementia connection model, how do we... How do we go forth with this? Now we can hear, we've heard why we should, and why is always a question I ask. So I'm, I was super excited that that's how you started this talk today is explaining Absolutely. why do we do this? Because I always like to know why. So now how do we do it? Yeah. So, so essentially when you look at the second language is habilitation, the key here is that you can use the dementia connection model and you'll get an immediate response because again, if you were to play um, music, let's say that mom likes, right. And that she really enjoys, it's going to influence her to feel all those feel good feelings. Right. But the key here is, is that first R, which is consistency, right. Or, or what we call routine, right. So essentially con you are consistently playing that music. You want to associate that with something that you're trying to do with her. Right. So I'll give you an example. Let's talk about um, bathing. Okay. We know bathing is a challenge, right? And now one thing I want to say before I get into how to use this with bathing is let's think about what do children like when they are bathed, right? The idea here that or the goal, let's say, is to be clean. We want to get our loved one clean, right? Now, children, when they're obviously infants, when they're born, we usually give them some kind of sponge bath. Then they transition into a regular bath. Eventually they transition into showers, okay? But, you know, my daughter is five and she still prefers baths. You know, sometimes she'll take a shower. You know, my son is seven and he is now pretty much fully in, you know, independent. I want to take my shower on my own kind of a thing, right? And so that's really going to be the progression of their likes and dislikes as well. You know, as they are progressing through the disease, they're going to be okay with showers for a bit. Then they're going to want baths then they're going to, it's going to be better for sponge baths, right? So we have to accept through the theory of retrogenesis that this is what's going to occur, right? So that's the first component of let's understand why this is happening. Why does uh, mom not want to get in the shower anymore? Why is she fighting with me? Um, those kinds of things, right? Let's just try to switch up the technique. Let's try a bath and let's see if she enjoys that better, right? So that's the, the, the first pillar, right? So then we talk about um, the, the third pillar, which is the uh, sensory stimulation or sensory-based knowledge, right? And we say, what can we do during bathing that will make this a very positive experience? Well, we can do lots of things from a sensory perspective. We can play music, let's say. Let's play, let's say she loves Barbara Streisand. I just said my mom loves Barbara Streisand. <laughs> let's play Barbara Streisand in the, uh, into the, in the bathroom where we're at. Um, from a tactile perspective, let's give her something to hold on to, maybe a loofah, or maybe she can hold the shampoo bottle, help her feel purposeful in that fashion, right? And also why tactile simulation is so powerful is because not only is it her ability to feel purposeful that she's doing something, uh, but there's also a process in our brain that's occurring simultaneously called neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. And essentially she's creating new, neuro new neural pathways, but what's the really wonderful thing about this what Jessica and I was talking about is side benefits of neuroplasticity is that it helps to reduce anxiety and fear and increases attention and focus. Like that's the best recipe when you're doing any ADL with someone with dementia, right? So tactile stimulation is great, right? Um, you could be diffusing uh, lavender essential oil in the uh, bathroom and lavender has been shown through research to be very calming, Right. So those are just some examples of ways that you can use sensory stimulation of a way to create an experience that will make her feel relaxed, happy, content, all those feel good feelings. Right. So when you do that one time, 
right? Uh, through uh, when we talk about habilitation, we're reinforcing skills, right? You're going to get that immediate response. You know, she will feel calmer and et cetera, right? Now, if you associate these three exact things every single time you bathe her, so you've got the essential oil going, uh, the aromatherapy, you've, you're playing Barbara Streisand, and she's holding on to that uh, sponge bath or that um, the sponge or the shampoo, let's say, um, about over about a four to six week period, she will really associate that with those feel good feelings almost automatically. So you can play Barbara Streisand and she will already want to uh, go into the bath. She will want to enjoy that bath. She will want to, all of those things, right? And that allows you as the caregiver to feel much more calm. You're feeling successful because you are able to bathe her the way that you feel like you need to, right? And then there's a connection there. You're enjoying your time with her. She's enjoying her time with you, right? And it makes the bathing process so much easier and rewarding, right? And so that's just an example of how the dementia connection model can work with bathing. Um, I'll tell you this, this is a, this is a great story. Uh, and this is actually in my book. Um, I had done a very uh, brief mock study where uh, in one of our facilities that I was working at around the dining process in this, in this sense of sensory stimulation, right? And so what we had done is uh, we had a consistent way every single day of how we did each single uh, meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with our residents who had dementia. So there are a couple of things. We played specific music at breakfast versus lunch versus dinner. We um, diffused different oils depending on time of day. So in the morning, we would diffuse uh, different kinds of citruses. In the afternoon, we did citruses. And then afternoon, we did um, citrus and lavender, right? Uh, because citrus scents actually increases appetite which is wonderful, right? We need that for people who are struggling with their appetite as the disease progresses, right? So we did that. Um, and then we also had a, diff a specific way that we would set up the dining table. So that way it looked like a dining room and there was no other confusion as what it was to be used for because sometimes in nursing care, dining rooms can be used as activity rooms and vice versa. And so we made sure that the room was set up for dining, right? And so what was interesting is we did this, of course, we got immediate responses of patients uh, eating right away. Oh, one thing I failed to mention is we actually used different uh, plateware too. We used bold plateware. So we used um, red and yellow because research has shown that red plateware actually increases appetite and yellow sustains attention. And you think about this, right? When we think about the theory of retrogenesis and when we talk about what stimulates children when they're younger is children don't like to eat off of plates that are white or cream, that's not fun. What are, when you go to any Bye Bye Baby store, right? When you go to the feeding section, everything is bold colors, bright red, bright yellow, bright orange, right? Because it keeps them excited about eating. So the, again, we apply that same concept to people with dementia. And so actually studies have been shown that it has increased appetite for individuals with dementia, actually by 25% more consumption was found in one research study. So we tried it as well. And we found the same effects. Um, but the the interesting part with the theory of retro, or, uh, sorry, with uh, habilitation is we wanted to see if this will sustain over time. So every single day for about a month, we did this consistent uh, approach, right, with the plateware and the essential oils and so on, right? And it was funny because we have, you know, normally in senior living, you have staff that escort the residents to the dining area when it's time to eat, right? Well, after just a few weeks, when we would... Uh, put our aromatherapy on and we would play that music, we had residents wheeling themselves to the dining room because they learned it's time to eat. All of this is associated with it's time to eat. And when, when they got to the dining room, they were visually reinforced because they got to see the dining set up. They saw the bold plateware. So they knew, yep, it's time to eat. So we had patients becoming more independent by wheeling themselves to the dining space without needing staff assistance. So there's a reward there. Residents were more independent. Staff had less work to do. They could just observe and supervise and guide, right? Um, so I talk about that study in the book, and it just was an absolute wonderful experience to see the model really come alive in this mock study that we did. That makes sense. I have a question on the bathing, because yes. everything that you said, I've heard and I tried to implement with my mom 
except mm-hmm. for taking baths. Now, she wasn't a bath person, and in the home that she and my dad had for 47 years, they um, they had to redo the bathroom because of dry rot and all that, you know, typical stuff of homes as they age. And so she took out the bathtub for a couple reasons. One was that typical kid-type bathtub. Wasn't great for adults anyway. But it also, you know, because you have to step up and over, it does become a possible hazard. And we all know that bathrooms are like the most dangerous room in the house. Right. So she didn't have a bath. She had basically a slightly stepped into the shower. It wasn't flush with the floor. What I forget what those are called. The no threshold showers, I believe. Mm-hmm. And the same thing was in her care home. She, it was, you could have wheeled a wheelchair and it was, it, you know, they were the de- designed for, um, I don't want to say disability, but I guess that's kind of what they're for, you know, definitely designed for safety. Mm-hmm. And I've also read and had confirmed from a gal that is living with FTD that sometimes the water hitting the skin from the shower feels like needles. They actually redid their shower in their house, and she really enjoyed it the first time. The second time, she got very disoriented, and the water hitting her, it was just, it was just bleh, too much. So in the care homes, they don't have bathtubs. I'm not, I'm just, I guess, how do we reintroduce a a bath bath to an adult who hasn't taken a bath bath for dozen years absolutely or more um i would say that a lot of senior living spaces are moving more towards having bath options um as a kind of spa feel and so as more um senior living organizations are partnering with dementia gurus right and really understanding what works for them some of that is kind of being re-implemented but i would say start with a sponge bath Um, And so very similarly, we would give a sponge bath to an infant. You would take out one arm and you would um, clean with the sponge. Then you would dry and put the arm back and so on and so forth, right? Introducing that kind of sense of having the warmth of the uh, water around the body, right? Rather than just pouring on the head. And to your point, two things with that, you know, yes, it feels like needles, That's one aspect, especially if they're dealing with a lot of um, different kinds of pain, um, like neuropathy and things like that. But the other thing, too, is let's let's uh, take that theory of retrogenesis again. Right. When you stick a young child under a shower, it scares them to the bejesus because they don't know what that is. Right. And they scream and they cry. Right. And so, again, when the person with dementia is reversing back when that comes out and hits them, they get really scared. And so the fear increases and then they act out, right? And we talk about these behavioral expressions of yelling out and and maybe some aggression, right? Or they want to leave, they want to run. Well, that's what we do when we're scared, fight Mm -hmm. or flight, our instinct, right? And so because they're going back to a younger state, their, their instincts are gonna be more their coping skills, which I talk about in the book, rather than them being able to rationalize what's going on and think how to problem solve their way out. They're, they can't do that anymore as the disease progresses, just like young children can. Young children just fight or flight, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so it could be because of pain, but it could be that fear based on just something hitting them in the face and they don't know what it is and they weren't expecting it, right? Uh, because part of this is they don't know how to expect anymore, right? They don't know what's coming next, because the ability to problem solve or what we call anticipate, right, is all housed in the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe, unfortunately, is, is decompensating over time. So their right. ability to it's not going to be there anymore. So they don't know. I get into a, sh- a, sh- a shower. I turn on the knob and that water is going to come out. They don't know that anymore. They just think I'm here. And all of a sudden, there it is. Right. Very scary for them. And then they act out. And then, of course, the caregiver is confused. Why are they yelling? Why are they hitting? Why are they trying to get out of the bath? I don't understand. And it's because we just scared them to the bejesus. We didn't mean to. We didn't know that. That's just we just didn't know, right? So that's a lot of the challenges that that occur, you know, when we're caring for people with dementia. That's pretty much what happened with my mom. She got extremely aggressive in the last year. She, the more help she needed, the more she resisted which I'm sure if we talk longer, you can probably analyze why that happened. So we might have to to do that next week. 
<laughs> but the what happened with her, she walked with no aids, had no problem, you know, with any of that. But it took two caregivers to shower her, despite my guidance and coaching on how to maybe get her to cooperate better. I think this is where more time would be beneficial. That way they're not rushed that they got to bathe, you know, 10 residents or, I mean, I know they had like, they shifted her once to afternoons and it got really bad. I'm like, no, 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 this is a morning shower woman. And they switched her back to mornings and it got better. But in the last year of her life, she, she literally scratched caregivers till they bled. It was embarrassing, but she jerked away from them. This is my interpretation. They said she reached for her clothes after a shower and slipped. You know, you don't slip just by reaching. <laughs> I know my mom, she jerked away from them in super irritation and, and then slipped and broke her leg. And that was the end of that. So the other thing I thought of after I've talked to, you know, hundreds of people is that shower that they had for them. And, and many of us do this in our homes, you know, like white subway tiles, a big design thing right now. That shower was white floor walls, the ceiling, I think was white or cream. It wasn't colored. And so it must've kind of felt it was the opposite of all the bold colors you're talking about with the plates and the dishware. Note to self, don't get red plates when we replace our plates. Cause I don't need to eat 25% more, <laughs> but you know, so I was thinking it's like, if there's a brand new assisted living memory care community, that's about to open here in town. And I'm going to go over there and see if they have tubs. Cause now I'm curious because you know, you have the walk-in tubs, which I still don't understand how that works, but maybe someday I'll figure that out. And you know, it's like if the, I thought if they had colorful tiles on the wall or even, you know, the designers and people are going to go, Ugh. but if it was multiple colors, which doesn't sound at all attractive, actually, but it might help. Because like Mike, I've said before, my mom's visual processing was just just didn't exist, really. And I wonder if that would have helped. But I know she also wasn't accustomed to sitting and they would try to get her to sit you know, for safety reasons. And it's just, well, yeah, well, to, about the color, I actually do talk a lot about colors and, and how to uh, address the environment with relation to that as well, because colors plays, plays a huge role in this. And a big piece of it is what are colors that are going to, of course, stimulate more positive moods and that because it's a visual stimulation. I mean, lime green, let's think about that, right? Lime green is the longest color that we all can see. So with people with dementia, it's actually a very safe color. They can navigate better when they see green, like bold green. Um, and so, and actually there was a study done where they looked at it lowered aggression uh, hmm. and actually improved falls. So the line, so there was actually, uh, we use this at the uh, company that I worked for. We implemented all the CNAs and nurses or lime green scrubs. And it, it was a tremendous effect that it had on the behavioral expressions that individuals with dementia had. Um, and so it, some organizations kind of picked up on that and started to do, to do that. So color is big. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about what you had just said with regards to, the, you know, they try to get mom to sit all the time, right? In the let's, shower. In the shower, right? Let's, let's, plot, let's um, play on the dementia connection model, right? When you try to force a two-year-old to sit, <laughs> do they sit? No, they don't. They're going to get no, they up. They become they, stiff as a board. <laughs> right. Exactly. So why would we think that people with dementia are going to want to just sit too, right? And be forced to sit, right? Because they don't know what you're trying to do with them. And so especially those who like, let's just say gently guide them down and hold them and say sit. And they do this over and over. The person with dementia is getting frustrated. They don't know why they need to sit, right? So they're going to get more and more agitated, more and more frustrated, right? And to the point where they just have had enough. And so they get up and they usually fall because they're so angry or they want to swat or they want to kick, you know? So to avoid that, we've got to engage them in different ways that will be exciting for them to want to sit, right? If we think sitting is going to be more appropriate to help with reducing falls, right? So engage them with something. So for example, I talk a lot in the book about 
animatronic pets or different ways to engage through puzzles, or uh, you can even um, use infant doll therapy, right? Things that will stimulate them in positive ways using all kinds of senses that will, they'll say, yeah, I want to stay here and do this, right? Because again, when you can engage a two-year-old, you sit them down, you have something in front of them for them to do, they're going to want to stay, But if you give them nothing to do, they want to get up and run around, right? So the same path is going to happen with people with dementia, too, from what we know from the theory of retrogenesis. That makes sense. And I think my mom would have benefited, probably, it it would have been worth trying one of those, um, like the reborn dolls, ones that look Mm -hmm. pretty realistic. Although I don't know if she would have needed one quite that realistic. Those really do look like real babies. They do. (laughs) Because my mom was always a helper, a caregiver. You know, she was a mom. She was a grandma. She always wanted to help the other residents. I almost hurt myself trying really hard not to laugh out loud when she leaned out her, her apartment door and said, you know, if you need anything, just let me know. I'm here to help. And I thought, oh, right. <laughs> you know, like, okay, well, you're in better shape than her because she's got a walker and, you know, you can at least walk unaided, but I, when she said that, it just struck me so hysterically funny. And I was, I thought, if I laugh out loud, she's going to get mad at me. <laughs> and, and it was just, I mean, the whole thing was like, it was almost surreal because the way she leaned out the doorway was kind of like, it was like a throwback to like, you know, the town I live in. When she grew up here, it was like 1500 people. There was more cows than there were people. <laughs> so I was I was getting this visualization of this farm town that was, you know, used to be really rural. Now it's a typical suburb. And, you know, like kind of like the Aunt B from Andy yeah. Griffith showing my age now, you know, just leaning out the door. Oh, let me know if you need any help. But it's just like, yeah, yeah, like you can't help them because you can hardly help yourself. So perhaps I did not. I should have known that about Lime Green, though. Mm-hmm. And perhaps that's what she always did was, you know, you know, how, you know. Hope, you know, in, in the town that she grew up in, like you're explaining and all those kinds of things, maybe she was in that moment for herself. So probably it just it just hit me hysterically. And I was just like, excuse me, what? No, it's like I didn't say anything. I didn't you know, try to correct her or anything. It just I just knew not to laugh out loud because mm-hmm. that would have been rude. She would not have appreciated that at all. Mm-hmm. So but no, I I don't know why I forgot that lime green was the longest color we can see. You know, being a photographer, you would have thought I'd remember that, but most people don't wear lime green in portraits. So they don't. They don't. <laughs> That's interesting because when they re they um renovated the community that she lived in, you know, so it was all rusts and browns and golds and and it looked very very nice, but there were some serious things that were not practical. The care staff was like, I don't know why they had to. They used to have these almost hospital like lounge like reclining chairs and mm-hmm. then they went to like typical living room furniture not practical mm-hmm. right. and the way they had it arranged it wasn't easy to get the wheelchairs right it's like you yeah. know they they made it pretty for those of us that were visiting our relatives they didn't really necessarily make it functional for the residents like it was fine for my mom cuz she walked just fine but for a lot of people they needed the loungers. They needed, they needed space. And, you know, it was interesting. But they did use red plates. Um, but they did also use the dining tables. They would push them together and do the activities. So there was a differentiation between activity time in this space and meal time in this space. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they get they get pretty good marks on that one. I was just, as you were talking about some of the things that help give them a little bit more independence of everything we just talked about. I was like thinking about what they did where my mom lived. And so they did pretty good considering, you know, I think everybody's still learning about this disease. Absolutely. I mean, I think that unfortunately I think some owners and operators, they, they want it to look nice. As you said, they want it to almost look like a hotel feeling, but the reality is, is the bet and the more you can make it look like a home for persons with dementia, that's going to make them feel more safe and secure and not this unknown place. And so I think that some new owners and operators who are revamping their dementia programs, some, some things they're getting right, but not everything. 
And so, you know, they really do need to work with people who are experts in the field to guide them as to what's going to work and what's going to really promote the independence of the person rather than, you know, worrying about does this look beautiful, right? So. Well, then they need to work with the sales team to translate or not translate, but to, to give that information to people that are looking. Like when I went and looked and my listeners know this, my sister and I don't agree on anything. And we had agreed on a plan for mom's care after dad died. He was on hospice. And then, you know, because I didn't want to make life easy, I jumped off that page. You know, <laughs> And fortunately, the plan we had did not, you know, the person that we were going to involve was not interested. It was my mom's sister. So she helped kick the plan to the curb, which saved my, my hide a little bit. But I went looking for, you know, a, a nice community for mom. There was literally one down the hill from my house. I knew from having been there before that it... It was dark and it was dreary and just, it was no, which would have been nice a mile down the hill from my house, but it just, it wasn't right. And I went to this one and, you know, they showed me around and it was nice, you know, in the assisted living dining room, they had flowers and salt and pepper and silverware on the tables. And you go into the memory care part of the community and the tables are naked, no tablecloths, no napkins, no pretty little fake flowers or any of that. But I understood why that was. And when I took my sister there, she's like, well, I wish it was as pretty over here as it is on the other side. And I'm like, well, pff, none of that crap would stay on the tables anyway. It would all disappear. I mean, I understood that, but it, I felt the same way. It was like, yeah, I wish it could be that way too. I understand why it's not. And so I, and having been there for three years and seen other family members, I can see why they make them look like hotels and not like places that help help them maintain some of their independence and their abilities as long as possible. So we need to communicate all of these, all of this stuff that you've learned and, you know, other dementia gurus have learned. And we need to, we need to help educate everybody, which is kind of my mission and yours as well, because, you know, you don't want to walk in and you don't want to pick a memory care residence based on how pretty it is and how perky and young and energetic the care staff is you want people with knowledge and understanding like everything that you went through to teach people stuff so that's that's another hill to climb <laughs> <laughs> one training at a time right yeah for real it's like oh my gosh yeah i'm like trying to i'm trying to like pave the way so if i need memory care you know it's it's gonna be all better than it has <laughs> been but geez it's taking forever <laughs> <laughs> So is this a good place to stop and we can pick up again next week? Or did Absolutely. there's anything else we want to cover before we wrap it up? No, I think this is good. And maybe next week we can get into how does the model work with uh, behavioral expressions? Um, so when, when people are feeling they have depression or maybe they're experiencing some hallucinations or some anxiety, um, you know, those kinds of things, we can talk about how the model will work for, you know, all those behavioral expressions that we see. Well, there's your clue to tune in again next week. And I want to thank Dr. Jennifer for today. And we will be hearing again from her next week. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.